Well, good evening. Welcome to Space Oddities. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday evening. Lovely to have you all with us. Let's just see who's uh, who we know that's in the chat this evening. Um, evening all. Evening, Alan. Uh, oh, Rob, Robin's in. Hello, Robin. Hope you're well. Uh, Steve's in. Kevin's in. Ev oh, everybody's in. So uh, thank you for joining us. We have a very interesting program tonight and a very special guest for you. But uh, before we get on to that, I'm joined this evening by Daz. How are you, Daz? I'm lovely, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm off to... of opinion, but carry well, on. Oh, yeah. No, I've just spent three days on crutches, so I'm happy to have be getting rid of them. Hmm? Oh, it's just a, I had a seized knee. It, uh, it, it, I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to wave my knee around showing everybody the swelling. But, <laughs> you know, unlike some. Oh, no. <laughs> Michael, yeah, Michael, show us your thumb. <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah. We were yeah, no, it's, it's just one of those things. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all on the men, so it's no biggie, no biggie. Yeah, we're, we're a bunch of old crocs here. This is the <laughs> sign of approaching years, I fancy. Roger, down in deepest, darkest Sparkford. Have you got clear skies, Roger? Uh, not at the moment, but there is a forecast for a brief spell later. Ah, you ought to be here, Ooh. mate. We've got stunningly clear skies tonight. Uh, uh, we always do when it's space oddities night. It's uh, quite the swan here as well. Really? Mm. Well, you're in a t-shirt. I know. Gosh. I'm indoors. Yeah. <laughs> Please notice, uh, viewers, that the Space Oddities t-shirts are available. It's a very reasonable price. As uh, as modelled here by our pouting, gorgeous uh, Michael. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll give you the details later. Regulars will, will know this uh, <laughs> uh, very well. I'd like to welcome Pete. Uh, how are you, Pete? Doing fine. Sp being spent i mean before i retired i was i was working on them with data from the mars rover for varying projects for different universities and since i've retired i'm now building a lego model of it <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> wonderful which, which wonderful. one is that what which rover is that again the uh, perseverance perseverance all right cool. that's what you need to build it <laughs> yeah, yes yeah plenty of it yeah i saw yeah. the photo of you sitting there Looking, Looking as if you know which bitch went where. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a labor of love, mate. Labor of love. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, have you got anywhere to, to display it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then uh, we've got Mr. Keith Mosley. How are you, Keith? Oh, fine, thank you. Yeah, I've been out in the dark as well. But uh, my <laughs> surgeon who put a piece of titanium in my neck tells me I'm not allowed to tilt my head back and look up anymore. So. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Got this. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I use my time in the dark chasing the deer out of my garden. They eat everything. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. <laughs> oh, stop that right now. I've had enough with Keith all day. Keith and I pass our days uh, sending each other incredibly bad jokes uh, over Messenger. And today's been a bit of a bumper day, hasn't it, Keith? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Uh, welcome to Bernard, who we haven't seen in a while. Everything okay, Bernard? Look, I'm the youngest of the batch, so of course I feel quite good. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. How's the um, How's the book going? I've just my editor uh, emailed me today and said, "How's the book going?" <laughs> and I just emailed him. I said, I probably need another three months. I haven't heard a reply yet. So That's yeah. funny because yeah. I had an email from him earlier today saying, make sure you ask Bernard about the book. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> How much did he pay you for that? Uh, oh, I'm not going to tell you that. That's, yeah. between me, that's between me and my accountant. Yeah. So, uh, so, so there you are. Welcome, Bernard. Lovely to see you back. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, thank you for being here. And last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce you all to our very special guest this evening, Dr. Niall Smith who's going to be talking to us this evening about the incredibly fascinating uh, subject of bioforming. Now, when I was speaking at the uh, County Mayo uh, Dark Sky Festival in November in County Mayo in Ireland, uh, I saw Niall give his talk and I thought he would be perfect for space oddities. And, uh, and I managed to twist his arm into coming along tonight. So Niall, it's, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to have you with us tonight. You're very welcome. Well, thank you very much. I think the pleasure's on mine. There wasn't much arm twisting. Uh, the issue, the, the arm twist, will be to stop me talking. So I, I think we've agreed on a, on, a, on a reasonable quantum of talk from me tonight. But it's brilliant to be here, and yeah, I'm really, I'm really delighted. So thank you for the invitation. Oh, that's my pleasure. You're, you're 
you've got the link, the link never changes. Uh, you can drop in anytime. Anytime you want to come and talk to us, you're always welcome on Tuesday evening if you've absolutely nothing better to do. So, uh, <laughs> so there we are. Now, would you, for the, for the benefit of our viewers, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Sure, yeah. So, Niall Smith's my name. I, I started out uh, as a as a boyhood uh, with a boyhood interest in astronomy i built uh, with my dad a a wooden clamshell observatory in the back garden at about the age of 10 he was a fitter and turner and we actually built an equatorial mount he had laid and so on at home so wow. you know when i say we built it i mean he did absolutely allow me to use the lady was brilliant that way but we built that, we did the dials, the RN deck and so on, and, and put a motor on it. So it was motorized um, and it was reasonably good, but it, w it, was, it was a massive learning experience. And so I got absolutely hooked on just looking at the skies from a very early age. And sure. so went to, you know, went to college, I did a degree, did a, my PhD, what then was in astrophysics. And that was really what I always wanted to do. I think it's something it's interesting and I had no idea what was going to happen subsequently. And I know we all give advice to people about, you know, your career and this and that. I gave none of mine. I just simply wanted to study the stars. I wanted to be with people who study the stars and no idea where it might lead. Mm. But I was lucky enough to get a, a job in what is now Munster Technological University. And just behind me then, back in 2005, uh, we put in a proposal to the city council to convert a place called Blackrock Castle into an observatory. And I fully expected at the time that proposal would be laughed out of court because it's one of the iconic buildings in Cork. It's actually the oldest standing structure in the city Is that's still in use. Wow. And, uh, and the city manager said, uh, yeah, put an observatory in a visitor centre, go for it. And we were told subsequently that there was a view amongst the the city council that we were probably mad and it would never work but uh 17 and 19 years later rather now at this stage uh, we've been open to the public for uh 17 years uh we were in there for two years prior to that we've had about 1.4 million um visitors in that time and uh you know we're a small enough outfit but we keep going uh, we employ uh uh, eight people full time, and we have a bunch of part timers as well. So, so that's really good. And actually, um, I, I we continue to do. I continue to do some work on uh, my my own research, um, which isn't really the the the, the uh, subject of tonight. I'm I'm stepping a bit outside my comfort zone, Andy, as as I will explain uh, with this bioforming. But uh, there's a reason why I'm I'm doing that because I think uh, conversations outside your comfort zone often are what keep you fresh. And um, anyway, come to that in my talk. So yeah, I'm just super excited because I just. I love the stars. I love the moon. I love anything to do about astronomy. And I hope that I will have many more years of um, being able to do that. So, yeah. I'm sure you will now. Well, as I said, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I, I was saying to Frank, actually, that um, the trio of, of talks that we did between me, you and him, there was a lovely symmetry to it because he was talking about astronomy, the ancient past. I was talking about cutting edge modern astronomy and you were talking about projects of the far future so it was it was it was a really nice sequence of talk I, I, that was a fantastic weekend as i'm sure you'll agree it was was, uh, it, and actually your talk was super i, I don't know if everybody's seen which talks you give but I, i'm looking forward to your next one so we're going to get you down to the observatory to give a talk to us that's oh you right, i'm there i'm there <laughs> <nice. laughs> i'm there thank you very much i'd love to i'd absolutely adore to anytime so uh so there i'm hoping to um i'm hoping to retire in october so i'll have a lot more time on my hands then. Uh, and that's exactly how i would like to fill it so Brilliant. so there we are okay now if we may we'll come back to you for your presentation a little later uh just a, f a few housekeeping things thank you to all of you who uh, insist on buying us coffees every week we are very very grateful for your support and every bit of the money goes towards keeping the channel running and as usual if you would like to buy us a, uh, a coffee, you may scan the QR code here, and um, and that will take you to um, to the to the website where you can buy us a coffee. And I know regulars, you're probably fed up with me saying this, but we really do appreciate your your financial help keeping this channel running because, like any YouTube channel, we have bills to pay, and uh, you know. Cups of coffee do help a lot towards uh, keeping us going. So thank you so much. And we really, really do appreciate it. Don't we, guys? 
Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't forget, of course, as we said earlier, that the Space Odyssey <laughs> T-shirts are available. And um, they come in a range of 10 colors. Well, you can only have one of the 10 colors. You don't get a T-shirt with 10 colors. So uh, only one at a time. Um, these are an amazing not-to-be-repeated price of £20, but that does include UK postage and packing. If you want to send one abroad, please add £10 to that for foreign orders. They're really good quality, and you're probably thinking, oh, you would say that, wouldn't you? But we've, I think we've all got one, haven't we, more or less? Yeah. And, um, and they are, they're really good quality. They're long-lasting, and uh, with summer coming up, they're the ideal gift for you or, or someone in your family or a friend. Yeah. So uh, you can scan the code to buy your Space Oddities T-shirt before the even, summer. Uh, even Jerry says that the T-shirts are excellent. He has two. There you are. And, and you know, we know Jerry to be an upright Jerry, uh, sorry. Jerry, member of the community. Yeah. So um, there we are. Yeah. Jerry says they're great, and, and they are. I'm very <clears> happy to find. <throat> I think we all are. If you would like something, uh, you know, a little warmer before summer arrives, we have, do have the Space Oddities hoodies that are available. These are available in six colors. They come in two ranges. Um, they, uh, they come in the over-the-head type with the design on the front and the, uh, the zipper type with the design on the back. These are £40, including, again, UK postage and packing. And we think that's a really good deal because, again, they're really high quality and they will keep you warm before the arrival of summer. Although, in my case, summer seems to have arrived because it's been 25 degrees and blue skies here for a few days. Um, I think we've passed our winter now, which is fantastic. <laughs> so um, sorry about that, guys. Anyway, I promise not to mention it again. Uh, so, so there we are. Um, do keep your images for the gallery coming in. If you would like to uh, show your image in the weekly viewers gallery that we do, then you simply email them to spaceodditieslive at gmail.com. That's spaceodditieslive at gmail.com. One image per email, please. And if you could include the details of how you took the image with what equipment, etc., And if you could entitle the email gallery entry or something like that, something that contains the word gallery so that we can find it easily in, in books, that would be greatly appreciated. And um, very, very important, please remember to uh, like, subscribe and leave a comment because that helps the YouTube algorithm notice us more on YouTube and recommend our videos to people it thinks might be interested. And that helps us to grow the channel. And uh, it really does help us. So if you could like and subscribe, if you haven't done so already, certainly, you know, click the like button. Um, we hope you'll subscribe. You can click the notification icon, of course, to be notified of what we're doing and what our upcoming videos are all about. And if you leave a comment after the video has appeared on the channel, uh, then um, that really helps the algorithm as well. Your support in that would be much appreciated. Okay, that's the housekeeping bits over. So in time on a tradition now, we're going to go straight to the man with his finger on the pulse of the universe. Uh, in other words, Roger. So Roger, what's, uh, what's up in the night sky at the moment or in the future? <clears throat> well, we've got the, the usual uh, starts and we've got rather a lot of images come through from the James Webb. So... Uh, We'll, uh, we'll work our way through that. And then we've got another massive gallery by our membership. Oh, another one. Another one, yes. It can't, they can't hold them back. They just need to be presented because mm -hmm. they're so awesome. Right. Okay. So we've uh, worked our way through January and we're now going into February. So uh, here we go. Um, so currently we're... Uh, into the, to the uh, waning phase with uh, the last quarter towards the end of the week. So uh, that's not so bad. It's uh, not obtrusive too much at the moment. Wow, that's beautiful. Is, is that, that was, one of your images, Roger? That's one of my images, of course. <laughs> I wouldn't show anyone else's. No, of course. At this, at this stage. Uh, <laughs> that was just a few nights ago. So uh, That is beautiful. And that was shot through some cloud as well. So uh, yeah, that's brilliant. That is. I had to wave the magic wand of uh, Photoshop over it to. Uh, you see, not only does back. Roger have clear skies down in, in Sparkford, even when it's cloudy, the clouds are less thick than, than anywhere else. I don't know how he does it. Mm. Mm. Well, he just said he used witchery on it. 
Oh, you used to be oh, witchcraft oh. on it. Yeah. Ah. Ah. Can you describe this Photoshop? Yes. <laughs> steady, steady. Absolutely. We so uh, we've uh, still got Orion dominating the southern horizons, and uh, Jupiter is still quite a good sight to see at the moment. And uh, that's about it, really. So uh, there we've got the uh, winter circle still in full view, and uh, all the associated objects contained therein. Uh, Leo is starting to make its appearance, so uh, galaxies season will be approaching soon after Orion has set. Roger, do, do you do you image Leo a lot with, with this time of year? Uh, not an awful lot. I try to focus on on around the Orion area and Canis Major because there's lots of uh, nice gaseous objects around that area to uh, to, to negotiate around. So, uh, but uh, Leo goes a bit higher up for me, so uh, it's... Oh, yeah. I can I can look at that at a much later time. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But uh, in the just before the sun comes up, we've got Venus, and if you're very very lucky with a pair of binoculars, you might just about see Mars. Ooh. But it will be very very low on the horizon as I put it through through the week. You can see it's just rising up enough. Ooh. So uh, yeah. But uh, Comet Ponds Brooks is um, exiting Cyg Cygnus now and uh, heading over towards Lacerta. So uh, there we go. And uh, here's the Emphyrus for, for it. Um, it's due to be at its peak brightness around about April. Right. So uh, there might be a... a, a a very good opportunity of seeing it as a naked eye object if the forecasters mm. with their crystal balls get it right. Or it could but be another... We know, but we know what comets are like, <laughs> even, yeah. at, even at this stage of its uh, transit around the solar system. Mm. But uh, we have a fainter comet, Comet 144P Kushida, which is traversing into... Uh, Taurus, and we'll be going past Old Debron on around the 10th and the 11th of February. Right. But uh, while I was waiting for uh, Orion to uh, rise up high enough, I decided to have a quick snap of it. And uh, Ooh, here it is. Lovely. And that was about a magnitude, just over magnitude 13. So uh, I was quite pleased with that. That's amazing, Roger. Well done. It's, it's nothing much more than a green blob, really, but yeah. uh, I got it. <laughs> you did indeed. I did indeed. And as you can see, it's in magnitude 13.5. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, not the best, but uh, if you've got the equipment that can point to it, then it's uh, not quite so bad. But this week we've had a jumbo collection mm. of uh, images from the James Webb. Just going widescreen now. It's just, go. yeah, I mean, it's, it was almost... Oh, this is... Um, this they is were, they were, yeah, they were trying to put in images for the, um, for our gallery, I think. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I wow. put them in. So, yeah, it, they seem to be focused on uh, face on spirals and things like that. Yeah, so. it, it's it's a survey called FANG, P-H-A-N-G. I can't remember what that stands for. Mm. But, That's um, nice, though. Yeah. Oh, look at these. Oh, and just... Wow. Um, it's it's in so close you can't get them all in in one frame. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's nice, yeah. Awesome. Incredible. Looks like look, looks like a feather. Hmm. It is rather. <clears throat> wow. Who yeah. said you couldn't get images like this with an infrared telescope? Mm. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, that's good. It's like a right uh, flywheel, isn't it? Flying. It is. That's that one, yeah. a very strange structure, isn't it? It's almost like a ring galaxy. Yeah, almost. Yeah, there's there's a couple like that. Um, yeah. 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 That's ring whale. Yeah, certainly is. That's wow, massive. that's, that's like a, an M fifty one type, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Although the the trailing arm of the spiral is really long, isn't it? Hmm. All those nebulas and stuff all, all, all the way around. Amazing. 
amazing. Oh, wow. Oh, gosh. So, we are certainly spoiled with this instrument, aren't we? Certainly are, yeah. Yeah. See, all these gaps in the um, the dust, if you see mm. the, these uh, bright stars, um, if when Roger, if, in the end, if Roger can go back to the compilation of things, mm -hmm. the stars are blue, and they've actually, all these voids that they're sat in, they've actually blown away all the dust. Um, oh. And... Um, but the, the stars that they're they're, uh, they're blue in color because we were talking about this earlier, and it's a bit confusing because we associate blue stars with new stars yeah. because of their brightness. But because it's infrared and the way they've colored it, uh -huh. the old stars are blue. <laughs> so, uh -huh. um, but there you can see the the um, yeah. the where they've blown away the gas and left these uh, these voids. Mm. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous. I tell you, well, wouldn't this make a fantastic planetarium show? Mm. Mm. Now, it looks like this one that you can see uh, other galaxies further through the uh, image mm. that this caught by the looks of it. Yeah, there's one about the five o'clock position, isn't there? There's loads of them. Yeah, all, loads. all red. Gosh, amazing. But look at all the, the groups of oh. Um, oh, wow. blue stars. Mm. Look at yeah, that. Another one looks like a ring galaxy, doesn't it, really? It does. Because what, what makes me uh, wonder is because if you see this like this one, and we've seen it in a couple of the others, is the bright ring that's actually around the center. Yeah. Um, because we will always assume that there's a, a black hole at the center there. Um, yeah. And of course, that, that's not going to be the accretion disk. No, but no, uh, no. it just shows how, what's actually happening in the center. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, uh, no, what do you think of these? Aren't they fantastic? Yeah, they're pretty sunny. Actually, they look they look three dimensional. Uh, that's yeah. something that you know they really look uh, not to, to, to. Yeah, you just kind of really. I'm amazed at the amount of structure actually that's in them, and yeah. uh, they, they also look like they could be something on a small scale. You know, like like if you squeeze a, a bit of stuff into your into a, you know into your tea or something, squeeze it around, you get some sort of structures mm. like this. And yet these are sort yeah. of you know, hundreds of thousands of light years across. So it's really interesting to see that. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Love yeah. It. Right, okay. So uh, we're, we're now uh, going to see the members gallery to uh, see what us on terra firma have managed to capture in the yeah, night. Yeah, just before you go on, um, Keith's just popped in. What's going on with the star diffraction spikes? They look, oh, wait a minute, they look uh, Hubble 4s. Other than sixes, JWST, uh, best not discuss live. <laughs> okay, no, no, no. sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. so well, that. I don't think anybody knows off the top of their head. So, we'll, we'll no. Like... Anyway. Anyway. Okay, so onwards and upwards with the gallery. Just another reminder if anyone's feeling up to it, We've got uh, the competition open for the uh, Astronomy Photographer of the Year. This is obviously year 16, so uh, feel free to uh, enter if you're feeling brave enough to uh, compete against all these other photographers uh, around the world. I've got... Um, I've got. I've put my name in, but I haven't put any pictures in yet. I've got to... Um, March to uh, to do that. Is it is it is it going to be the moon or the sun you'll be entering, Roger? Uh, that could be a possibility, but other objects are available. I was I was thinking the horse head up there, Roger. Mm. Uh, yeah, the horse head is good. Yeah. Right. Anyway, we've anyway. got we've got a few from Pete who's uh, in tonight, oh. and uh, these are some of the images that he's managed to capture on other equipment. This is a ninety mil Takahashi. And he's got uh, NGC 2244, which is commonly known as the rosette. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's great, that's Pete. Beautiful. Mm. Very nice. That's very nice indeed. Yeah. It's wonderful. Looks like a flower opening. Mm. Mm. That is wow. Gorgeous. Well done. Well, thank you, gentlemen. That's <laughs> quite correct. You can give us a more, uh, oh. From there, he's moved on to the bubble nebula. And this is with a 72-inch telescope. Oh. Not something that you find in the back garden. <laughs> Not here, certainly. Oh. <laughs> oh, whoa. Oh, that is a good bubble. Mm. That's fantastic. Mm. 
That's not a C star, is it? No, no, no. It's not bad. It's not bad for a ninety-second exposure. Oh wow! So where where was this telescope, Pete? Uh, in Halakalea in uh, Hawaii. Oh, oh nice. nice, nice, very nice. Ninety seconds. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's not a Hubble bubble. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, to complete the hat trick, we've got M82, also on the two-meter telescope. And this was just a minute. Yeah, just a minute exposure. Oh, well, oh wow. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on there, isn't there? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You get a, wow. lot of the, uh, a lot of the gases on there, so that's come out really well. And why wouldn't you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well done, Pete. Thank you. Now, this is an interesting one. Now, Steve Warbus has given a talk about how to get images using uh, a technique that he uses in Photoshop to uh, counteract the light pollution. Now, I've put oh, this yeah. one up, which is the light polluted um, images before he converts them to the images that we all know and love of the uh, Messier Cartier. So uh, here we go. This is the before. And this is the after. Oh, wow. I've, I've seen that talk. It's absolutely amazing. Everybody mm. needs to book Steve to do that talk. It's brilliant. It is. That is stunning. Mm. Well done, Steve. And Steve's in the chat tonight. Well done. Mm. I'll be yeah, in well touch, done, Steve. Steve. Brilliant. <laughs> Another winner, Steve. Yeah. He's uh, still got one to uh, put in, but uh, he's got the other 109. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll forgive him. Right, now we've got our regular Jerry Delay, and he's got his jellyfish with his Esprit 100 and his usual equipment with his Optolong Extreme. And here we go with that. Oh, oh I like that. That, that nice. is lovely. What a beautiful colour. Mm. <laughs> And we've got a, a new person uh, contributing of the son, Keith Maslin. Oh, thank you, Keith. Mm. If you're watching, thank you for sending that in. A wave and, a, and an HA filter. Oh, lovely. Oh, lovely. Mm. Beautiful. It's looking rather barren at the moment today on the, uh, on the surface. There's not much there at the moment, so... Uh, He's done well to capture what he's got on this. Yeah, there are some more coming around from the. I did the see that there side. was was some faculty and stuff coming around to yeah. uh, mm. to uh, there, but uh, yeah, we yeah, shall... some some of them are on sort of like their second time round there. They're mm. just coming round and they've actually deepened while they're on the far side. Oh right. So we could be in for some fun and games. We'll see. Mm. Okay, and uh, some more from David Garside. And this one is the California Nebula. Now, we've got two versions of this, a colour version and a black and white version. Right. So, uh, gives oh. you an idea of what, uh, what to do. Nice, mm, yeah. they're, they're both very good. I like the black and white one, though. That's kind of mysterious. Mm, very. <laughs> very good. Thank you for that, Dave. Nice one. Okay. And uh, then there's mine. Mm. Uh, this one is uh, more time with the horse head and flame. I've now gone up to about just over five hours now with this. And wow. now I just, I just need some more info to fill in the colours. Oh, oh wow. That is so spectacular in black and white. I know. Really it's really nice with the HA. So yeah. I might, go, really I might cool. just go black and white with it in the HA, I think. I think it's nice like that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think it's I think it's wonderful. Well done, Roger. Can you send that for the um, FAS newsletter, Roger? If you want me to, Michael. <laughs> That's Make only about point. half of it. There's a bit more on the top and the bottom, but I want I like to um yeah. to do it like that because it also fits in as my screensaver on my, oh, right. yeah. on, my on my desktop. So uh, yeah. there we go. Yeah. Don't forget to negotiate a price. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, that concludes what's up in the night sky for this week with the gallery from our subs subsequent um, membership well done well done everybody that was well done, yeah. so, uh, that's great <laughs>
Well, there you are. Um, some fantastic images there. Thank you, as ever, viewers, for sending in your images. Keep them coming because you know how much we love looking at them. And we really look forward to seeing what you've been up to with uh, with your equipment, so to speak. Uh, so um, anyway, let's move on. And um, oh, before we do, just a reminder, if you would like to send them into us, uh, email them to spaceoddersislive at gmail.com. One image per email, please, and entitle it gallery entry or something similar. Now we're going to move on to what's been happening in the news. So let's uh, have a look at what's been going on. Just give me one second to get myself sorted out here. And uh, and here we are. Now, the, uh, <laughs> the news of the week was that um, the slim lander, Japan's moon lander, which was intended to be a demonstration of precision landing technology on the moon. Now, if you think about when spacecraft normally land on the moon, they, they, they touch down somewhere within a big ellipse, which may be, you know, lots of miles across, because it's never really been possible for, for your spacecraft to land exactly where you want to put them. So Japan developed this lander called SLIM, um, and it was known as the moon sniper because they wanted it to have sort of sniper accuracy to put it down exactly where they wanted to. And um, it was very exciting for Japan to launch this. And unfortunately, this is how it ended up on the moon. It landed nose first, upside down, if you like. This image was taken by one of the two little rovers that it deployed on the moon after landing. And uh, we can see very clearly that it's, that it's upside down. Now, the first thing that the Japanese mission control knew about it was when they realized the batteries weren't charging, which meant that the solar panels weren't facing the sun. This was why. But they thought that if they waited, the angle of the sun might improve whereby the solar panels could catch the rays of the sun. And indeed, that's what's happened. So the slim lander, which they put into hibernation while they were waiting for the sun to change position, has woken up again and is carrying out science. So this is a, this is a really good result. Japan already considered the, the mission a success. The, uh, the nose first landing notwithstanding. <laughs> oh, interesting. There we are. Just quoted, uh, quoted a few uh, lines of rhyme there. Uh, they considered it a success because they managed to land it within 180 meters of where they wanted it to land, which, you know, may sound some distance, but considering the uh, many miles across landing ellipses that you normally find with planetary or lunar landings, this was indeed a precision landing. So uh, we look forward to the science. Of course, the only problem now is that if you want to look at the images from this lander, you have to stand on your head. But, uh, <laughs> but apart from that, uh, sorry. Uh, but anyway, so what happened to this lander to, to force it to land like that? Well, at first it was a mystery until they examined the photos that uh, Slim had taken on the way down to the moon. And this is what they found right in the middle there. What do you see? One of the nozzles from the rocket engine, which fell off as the spacecraft was descending, which uh, caused it to tip over and plow into the moon nose first. And, um, and there we are. So uh, we're very happy that the mission, you know, even though it had been declared a success by Japan, will go on to do useful science. And as I said, the two little rovers, uh, one, is, one of which is built by the Tomy Toy Company, which is a sort of a shape-shifting uh, rover ball thing uh we hope that, that we get lots of useful science about the moon from that so well done japan this is great news indeed moving on i've got some bad news this week something that isn't going to come back to life the ingenuity rover on mars and this was uh this is a great tragedy if you've been following uh, as we have the ingenuity rover of uh, uh, ingenuity helicopter on mars over the last three years it's taken its last flight, the 72nd. Don't forget that this was originally thought to uh, last only maybe five flights, but it's done 72 over three years and has proved yet again to be amazing engineering, the same as perhaps the, the moon exploration rovers um, were, were before them, uh, Curiosity, uh, not Curiosity, Opportunity, and uh, what was the other one? Opportunity and... Um... Ooh. Um, uh, um, um, oh God, memory's failing. Doesn't matter. So anyway, 
what happened? Well, the helicopter was descending after its second flight and, and a 70 second flight and suddenly communication with it was lost and uh, then regained. And what actually happened was that the ground it was flying over is really, really featureless, as you can see. Uh, in the back, it's this type of ground. It doesn't really have many features that the Ingenuity helicopter could really lock onto for navigation. And as a result, it came down at an angle and one of its rotor blades hit the ground and broke. And the uh, this image on the right shows the shadow of Ingenuity where you can clearly see that something is wrong. One of the rotors is is broken. It's an irregular shadow. So I'm afraid that uh, the poor Ingenuity helicopter has had its last flight lasting a lot longer and many more flights than anybody expected. The good thing is that it's proved that even in an atmosphere that's only 1% of the thickness of the Earth's, we can fly on Mars, that it's possible to put vehicles in the air on Mars. So congratulations, uh, NASA and the whole team and everybody who designed and built this amazing little helicopter uh, as a technology mm -hmm. test to see whether we can actually fly in the thin atmosphere on Mars. And lasting three years, Ingenuity has proved conclusively yeah. that we can. So RIP Ingenuity, you were great. It was Spirit the Ever Rover. Yeah, of course it was. God, I must be getting old. Anyway, let's uh, just look at uh, the uh, Nicole in M87. Now, you've, this is an iconic image of the famous supermassive black hole in the uh, galaxy M87. On the left, you've got the original image that everybody's familiar with that was on front pages all around the world. But on the right is an image that was taken about a year later, uh, just over a year later. And you can see that it's changed. And what's actually changed, you see the bright spot in the, uh, the, the donut, if you like. This is a phenomenon uh, known as Doppler beaming, whereby light that's moving towards us is brighter and light that's going away from us is fainter. What does this mean? Astronomers are really happy with this because it's enabled them to confirm that the black hole is behaving over time exactly as is predicted by general relativity. And, uh, you know, that's it. They're very happy yet again that, that relativity has been confirmed by the changes that we can see in the black hole in, in a little over a year. So this was good news for the Event Horizon Telescope. The Event Horizon Telescope obviously is responsible for both images. And uh, the Event Horizon Telescope is being expanded. The, uh, you may notice that the image on the right is slightly higher definition. This was due to the inclusion during that year by the Greenland Telescope that was added to the Event Horizon Telescope array. And uh, these images are still absolutely uh, mind-blowing. So that's fantastic news. Relativity wins again. Then um, something that may be of interest. Um, I don't know whether you saw this, Bernard, but NASA has plans to, after they're, they're, they're uh, launching to, um, to Europa this year, they have plans to land something on Europa and take uh, samples. And this is, uh, has the rather imaginative title of the uh, Europa lander. And this is an artist's conception of what it might look like. Now, this mission has not been green-lighted yet, but there is hope. But they have actually started work on it already. And if you look at this image here, you can see one of the engineers um, building as an experiment that robotic leg, which um, the problem is they don't know whether they'll be landing on slush or something solid on the surface of Europa. This is a, a sort of a, a shock absorber leg that is designed to carry the weight of the spacecraft um, so that it perhaps doesn't make too much of a dent in the, in the, in the surface. Uh, so, so this is really interesting. There's no word yet as to when this mission will happen, but um, NASA are very keen on doing this because we desperately need to get some samples from, from, uh, from Europa. What do you think of that, Bernard? Great idea. Uh, well, this is we've already mentioned about the Europa lander. It's already been a mission that's been proposed for over ten years now. Uh, yeah, and it was especially heavily um, um, lobbied by the the, the Texan uh, Congressman Culberson. And uh, when oh, he yeah. left the office five years ago, when he was voted out, uh, unfortunately, this mission was deemed far too expensive. 
right. and uh, and you know uh, hence why everything was fo just focusing on clipper but um you know uh, there's so much interest on europa that i'm not surprised that it's coming back into the news and that people are sort of rooting for it so yeah let's see let's see how this moves on into into the you know into the development process and um but it's um i'm you know personally i i'd love to have more robots on europa but i think it's too early i think we need to go there with clipper look at the surface you know try mm. to understand a bit more about what it's made of and where we could potentially land before actually even conceiving a lander but sure sure but, these things take forever and uh, you know if we want yeah. to see something land on europa we need to better send it now <laughs> so yeah otherwise we'll all be dead yeah so uh yes indeed i mean i, I assume it's, it's been all over the news this week so i assume the reason it's come back into the news is that it's advanced um another stage in its approval so um so perhaps we will see this mission actually happen Cool. Uh, if not, that guy in the photo is just wasting his time, isn't he? <laughs> so, um, so, so there we are. Okay, thank you for that, Bernard. Good news for Lisa. Lisa is the European Gravitational Wave <coughs> Observatory that is going to be launched in the mid 19, uh, 19, 2030s. Now, this is a trio of satellites separated by uh, about 26 million miles between each one. And they will fly in a triangle, and it's an interferometer using lasers um, instead of uh, uh, well, anything else, basically. And this will do the same job that LIGO does on the Earth as a gravitational wave detector. The only difference is that because the distances between these satellites will be so vast, measured in millions of miles that they can detect much lower frequency gravitational waves so we're looking at phenomena like merging supermassive black holes um, for example that uh, the current gravitational wave detectors cannot detect because you need a much bigger detector to detect these lower frequency gravitational waves so the good news is this week that lisa has been finally cleared it's gone through the planning and design stage it's now been approved as an official project of the European Space Agency, and it will now move into the construction phase. Launch is expected around 2033, 2034. So this is great news for gravitational wave science. Um, and there we are, basically. Okay, um, one photo that we didn't see in the gallery was this lovely uh, JWST image of the N79 star forming region. I think you'll agree with me, that's spectacular. Whoa. And um, this is located in the large uh, Magellanic cloud, and it includes 7.7 .7 micron light, 10 micron light, and 15 microns in, and 21 microns in different colors, as it says here. And this, this nebula is considered, uh, it's, it's like a younger version of the Tarantula Nebula, but it's actually got twice the star forming efficiency. It actually forms stars twice the rate of the Tarantula Nebula. And I think you'll agree that's an absolutely spectacular uh, image, so I thought I'd throw that one in. Uh, good news for Sierra Space. You may know Sierra Space from their Dream Chaser uh, space plane, which is is April, isn't it? Daz, I think is launching. Did we? Uh, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, Tomorrow. that's due to make its first flight in April. But they're also got a sideline in developing inflatable modules for use with space stations. And these are made out of materials that are actually harder than steel when they fully inflate, protecting them against uh, meteoroids and, uh, and anything else, basically, space debris and what have you. And uh, Sierra Space have become a bit of a specialist in this. And this week they ran the first test to fully pressurize it until it popped. And they got up to a pressure of 77 pounds per square inch, which is actually well over the uh, the NASA minimum for this type of uh, module because of safety. And uh, this is actually uh, this is actually that's actually what happened. So that was fun, wasn't it? Did more than blow the bloody doors off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So that was Sierra Space. Well done, Sierra Space. They will now, you know, uh, approve that. NASA are going to approve that design for use with space stations. 
And they are huge, these modules. They can accommodate many astronauts much better than the cramped conditions that they're currently enjoying on the International Space Station. Lastly tonight, jumbos. These are really odd objects in the Orion Nebula, uh, as seen by the James Webb Space Telescope. And they are called jumbos because it stands for Jupiter mass binary objects. Now, these are objects in pairs, as I, I hope you can see from this image. And um, we don't know what they are. They're five, six, seven Jupiter masses. They are therefore absolutely huge. Are they enormous planets, much bigger and more massive than Jupiter? Are they brown dwarfs? Well, they don't appear to be those either. Nobody knows what these objects are at the moment. And the fact that there are over 40 pairs of these objects is telling us something. But we really don't know what these objects are. And if we look at a close up of, of one of these pairs, uh, you can see these are both five Jupiter masses. So these are incredibly massive objects. And um, what's been discovered was in the news this week that the biggest pair, which is not this one, but it's another one of similar size, similar mass, is emitting radio waves and none of the others are and it's, the, it's interesting that it's the biggest objects of all of these pairs that are emitting these radio waves and uh, astronomers don't know why and it's emitting radio waves uh, all the time fairly steadily there doesn't appear to be any circular polarization in the radio light which means that they're not being produced as a result of some really strong twisted magnetic field like you get sometimes well like jupiter for example um so there's no magnet doesn't appear to be a magnetic field involved in the production of those radio signals so nobody knows what's going on with these objects we don't know what they are we don't know why the biggest pair of them is emitting radio signals it's a bit of a mystery all around really so i just thought i'd show you that and uh, believe it or not that brings us to the uh, end of the news for this week so there you have it. <clears throat> Very interesting. It is interesting uh, that there are a lot of brown and red dwarf binaries around in the uh, galaxy. So these just seem to be a scaled down version of those in a way. Yeah, absolutely. But they are very mysterious. And why that pair is emitting radio signals and the others aren't is is a bit of a, a bit of a puzzler, really. So yeah. uh, so there yeah. we are. Okay, let's move on to the main feature then. Uh, you've seen the B movie, and now we're going to move on to the A movie. So uh, I'd like to reintroduce you, Dr. Niall Smith, and uh, Niall's going to be giving us a presentation on bioforming. So, Niall, off you well, go. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about the, your your um, view on A and B movies, um, <laughs> but look, I guess, I guess it's time for me to say a few bits and pieces. No, look, that was really fascinating. One thing I love is um, I, I, I'm old enough to know when there seemed to be times when astronomy was going to go through sort of, you know, oh, we've, we've pretty much discovered most of the interesting things or there's a pause in new discoveries and so on. And then every so often we, we get new instruments, we get better resolution, we expand the maybe the wavelength range that we can see. And we always find things which um, puzzle us and challenge us. So it's really great. I mean, it's it's a, it's as fascinating, maybe more fascinating than it was when when some of us got started um, on this many years ago. And I think that's one of the, the great things about it. So again, thank you for the opportunity to have a have a, a, a conversation this evening in in relation to something that I'm interested in. Just uh, to say at the outset, I'm I'm going to talk about bioforming, and I'm going to dip into the. Um, as the bio might indicate, I'm going to talk a little bit about biology. I'm not a biologist. I'm a physicist. So this is very much about, um, about as you mentioned earlier, Andy, things about the future. Um, it's, it's a bit speculative, um, and that's something that, that I think is interesting for me about it. Um, and I will now try to move my slide. And for some reason, I'm every time I try to move my slide, I'm getting a chat. Can I remove that? Okay. Why am I seeing chat? Are you okay? Uh, I, it, there's an icon which is literally sitting over, move the slide on. Um, and if I go to press on that. Let, let, me, let me try pressing it to see what happens. There we are. Okay. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's, 
it's bizarre. I can I can see it and then it disappears. I may have to ask you, Andy, to move it on if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. um, it you should be able to also use your direction I'll try uh, keys my... on your um yeah on your pad. That if you press for uh, left and right, yeah, it should advance you. Should do anyway. It seems to be very resiliently resisting my valiant attempts. At least I'm interpreting them as valiant attempts to to move it on. It's just it's going to be one of those evenings, gentlemen and, and ladies. So my apologies on that. No, no anyway, if if it's okay, rather than have everybody stay up all night, we'll try to figure out if I can figure out how to to move forward and backwards. Um, maybe I'll just start by just also noting that um, a favors favorite individual of mine who you'll all be familiar with carl sagan and um, just somebody who inspired me when i was younger and i just always liked um two things about about to, to begin with first of all as a scientist it's always important that we deal with 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 facts but facts are often a bit fuzzy around the edges because they haven't really moved into the domain of being an actual known fact they're, they're a, maybe a proposition they're a hypothesis but the reasonable basis for making them and that's really where this talk is is related tonight so some of what i'm about to say may not turn out to be um what happens in the future a lot of it may turn out to be what doesn't happen in the future um but we take the the opening point that keeping your mind open is is important and trying to predict what we might be able to do in the future but not so open that your brain falls out and if you could move on the slide please andy um and so the the, the first thing i wanted to say really was that I'm going to talk a bit about physics, not so much about chemistry, and a little bit about biology. But uh, all of this is based upon laws uh, or or interactions as we know them in the universe. Uh, so while some of them may be putting those laws together in a speculative manner, there's nothing in principle to stop what I'm going to talk about uh, from being implementable. So uh, I think that's really important because we go on to the next slide. Um, we, we know that this, for example, is our is our home turf, a famous uh, image uh, of, of Earth rise from Apollo 8. And of course, we, we all consider this to be home, and indeed this is home. But if we move on to the next slide, it's not the only home that we have. I mean, the universe itself, uh, and actually during the conversation about what we can see from the James Webb Space Telescope and and the... the, um, the uh, uh, other instruments that we are now in operation. What we're seeing is the universe in many different forms, including gravitational waves, including including dark matter, estimates of dark energy. But we also see it, of course, in, in, in light, which is more obvious in the electromagnetic spectrum. And, and what we see really looks amazing. It's home. It looks like it is magic. But of course, it isn't magic, but it is magical. And the, the, the point here is that when we look at this image, we see structures that look very different to one another. Um, some in, in many ways are hard for us to understand. But as we get to understand them, we realize that they are all subject still to date to the same laws that we understand apply to us here on the Earth. And some of those laws, because the Earth is a small scale, you can't really test them until you go to big scale. But things, for example, like the general theory of relativity, which predicts things on large scales or 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 or, or with large gravity, where there's large gravity involved, that you can't predict on Earth or can't measure on Earth. You can predict it, but you can't measure it so much on Earth. You can do that out in the universe. And when we apply those laws, uh, these rules that we have determined from sitting on this tiny ball uh, in 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 our Milky Way galaxy, those rules seem to apply. So this is really encouraging because it does seem that the universe doesn't uh, act in a random fashion. Uh, at the quantum level, at the very small level, we have probabilities as to how things interact. But on a grand scale, there is a determinism about many aspects of the universe. And so that's important because what it does allows us to imagine that if we take the rules that we know and harness them in a different way, then maybe we can do something exciting. And in fact, then that often turns out to be the case. Imagine a universe where the, the rules changed all the time. Well, that would be a real nightmare. It wouldn't be magical. It wouldn't be magic. It would just be a nightmare to be in. But our universe does behave in a way which we have some handle on, at least. Of course, we can talk about, um, you know, there's the, the, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns and so forth. But 
to, to a reasonable approximation at the moment, there's lots in the universe that we seem to be able to understand. So next slide, please, Andy. Um, so conversations then, um, and I want to talk just for a couple of minutes about the importance of what conversations which are sometimes random. So I'm really interested in how different disciplines come together, have a chat. And when you have people who have knowledge from different areas of science and they come together and they have this open mind, but not so open that your brain falls out, then sometimes in these conversations, really interesting, really interesting things happen. For those of you who, who, who recognize um, uh, the, 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 it's good to talk from the BT, it'll give some idea of, of your age. If you don't recognize it, then, then you're young. If we move on to the next slide, um, please. So um, the, the, it, uh, this is really based upon a conversation, the, the, re the rest of this presentation, between a colleague of mine, Professor Roy Slater, and who's a biologist, and myself, and my background is in is in astrophysics. So we're very different, um, we have very different backgrounds and so on, but we happen to be having a conversation in the corridor in MTU, and Roy was talking about DNA, and I was saying, you know, okay, I don't really know much about DNA, Roy, and he was saying, well, it's fascinating. We were just chatting about Watson and Crick, and we were just talking about how Watson was a geneticist, and Crick was primarily a molecular biologist. So coming from somewhat different uh, disciplines, not massively different disciplines, but, but sufficiently different, that together they were able to uncover the, the role uh, or, or the, the structure of this molecule that we all now know as DNA back in 1953. And then we got talking, because that's what, what you do is you're just having a chat about work that Francis Crick did back in 1970s, which we'll come to in just a second. And he did it with a, a, a postdoc of his who went on to be a very notable chemist in, in his own right, Orgo. Um, and they together started to ask some questions around DNA. And so they kind of said, well, okay, I'm a chemist, you're a, a, a geneticist and, and, a, and a microbiologist and a molecular biologist. So I mean, what, what, what might DNA do what, what, that, that we didn't think was possible in this universe previously? So it was almost like DNA was a new force, something in the universe which might have, a, have an effect on it. Because after all, it, it's the, the reason in part why you and me exist and why life on the earth, for example, exists. So we go on to the next slide. So they, they wrote a paper back in 1972 and they called it directed panspermia. And directed panspermia um, is uh, it was at it was at a, a conference um, in, in 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 California, and because Crick was a Nobel Prize winner and Orgel was a a, a protege of his, um, they were able to present this idea, which was directed panspermia, which as is shown there was the theory that organisms were deliberately transmitted to the Earth by intelligent beings on another planet. Now, did people stand up and clap and cheer and say, brilliant, that must be what happened? Well, no, they didn't. They gave it a, it, it caused something of a furore and there was a kind of a, a view that maybe Crick um, had gone too far and th this idea of intelligent beings, it was around the time of UFOs being very prevalent. Um, the, the, I, the uh, There was also some new discoveries at the time to do with nuclear propulsion, um, which we mentioned just in a second. And so there was this idea that, well, they were just wrapping DNA, nuclear propulsion, um, and the idea that, that we had maybe been visited and so forth into this idea of directed panspermia. And it was probably a bit, you know, pushing the envelope more than it, than it should have. And so when myself and, and my colleague Roy were talking about this, we were saying, you know, yeah, this was something that you would write if you were a Nobel Prize winner. And we kind of laughed, laughed it off a little bit, much to um, our shame. And then a week later, Roy phoned me and said, you know, Niall, I was thinking again about this directed panspermia stuff and the idea that organisms were transmitted to Earth by intelligent beings. He said, that was back in 1972. So he said, I wonder, let's have a look a little bit more at what Crick and Orgel were saying in 1972 and maybe what we know today. So if we go to the next slide, please, Andy. So Crick and Orgel had two bits to it. They had the biological payload and the rocket science. So they proposed the spaceship and just reading out what it says here, the spaceship 
would carry large samples of a number of microorganisms, each having different but simple nutritional requirements. For example, blue-green algae, which could grow on carbon dioxide and water in sunlight. And the sunlight would be produced on board the spacecraft because, of course, these spacecraft that was envisaged would be traveling between the stars, and so there would be not enough natural starlight. A payload of 1,000 kilograms might be made up of 10 samples, each containing 1,000 million, million, million microorganisms, or 100 samples each of 10 million, million, million microorganisms. So they had this idea of a 1,000 kilograms payload, uh, which was being fed uh, by these simple um, uh, nutrient-rich sludge, for want of a better way of putting it, um, and being kept alive um, through sunlight that was produced artificially. So quite a heavy payload, a thousand kilograms, um, and, and these organisms were, were alive. So they, they, they were the idea was to keep them alive. And the rocket science was that at the time, the, with the second box, um, that they realized, because of course in 72, we, we had some idea of the scale of the universe, so that several thousand stars are within a hundred light years of the Earth and could be reached within as little as a million years by a spaceship traveling at only 60,000 miles per hour. And that was that was kind of feasible as that. And if we go on to the next slide, the summary of that really is that you had this biological payload of a thousand kilograms with this large number of microorganisms, which would require something to keep them alive. So you send that's your that's your payload, and then you'd have a spaceship which would be nuclear powered, which would travel at speeds of the order of a hundred thousand kilometers an hour, and it would take fifty thousand years to reach the nearest star, and less than a million years to reach the, the, the closest 2,000 nearest stars. So in Crick and Orgel's paper back in 72, they said, okay, then maybe this, this is kind of interesting. Who knows? Maybe we were um, intentionally seeded by a, 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 an intelligent race that had decided that um, in their case, they needed to um, survive by sending microorganisms from their planet, because actually Crick and Orgel said, imagine that the sun is about to go supernova and, and this particular race needs to at least send its DNA out. And of course, that's something I didn't mention, but of course the, the key here is that these microorganisms contain at least the, the, the DNA um, from that planet. So it's still a building block, even though it doesn't build into a person, it's, a, it's the DNA that gives you these microorganisms. But fundamentally, all the information of life on that planet is somehow encrypted in those DNA in the, those DNA um, molecules. So that was the idea, send it out into space and maybe it came to Earth. So myself and my colleague Roy said, well, okay, well, let's revisit this. What has happened since 1972? And were Crick and Orgel really off base or is there something new that we can add into the conversation? And this was about the, this, is a, this, this was an exciting conversation between myself and Roy and we wanted to be excited. We wanted to be enthused by this. We wanted to just say, let's just see, let's imagine within the rules of the universe. So back to the earlier part, we're not using magic here. Everything we're going to go from, say from here on for the rest of the presentation is known uh, to be possible or feasible. Whether it will be actualities will be something that we'll come to towards just the very end. So if we go to the next slide, please, uh, Andy. So, just to let you know that we did actually write a number of papers, but one paper that we were um, particularly uh, pleased about was one that got the front uh, of the, the journal Science Progress. Um, and uh, the reason for just indicating that is um, what I'm going to say has been peer reviewed um, and, and at least uh, it's, it's um, I suppose the best way of putting it is it's not completely cuckoo science. So, um, but it was derived from these random, this random conversation between myself and Roy. And I just wanted to emphasize that one last time because I think it's just so important going forward if we're going to make progress in general in science and if we're going to make progress in general in, in, in between our communities or if we're going to make progress between cultures, the critical thing that as sentient beings, we talk to one another. And, and it's really important that we don't only talk in an echo chamber to people who think the same of us or who have the same science background as, as, as whatever. Sometimes it makes it a very difficult conversation. Sometimes it makes a very uncomfortable conversation. But my goodness, sometimes it makes it a very productive conversation. So we go on to the next slide, please. So 
one of the key things that happened, <coughs> excuse me, of course, <coughs> since 1972, was that we discovered planets in habitable zones. And I think Sagan's <coughs> phrase is interesting here. The vast distances that separate the stars are providential. Beings and worlds are quarantined from one another. The quarantine is lifted only for those with sufficient self-knowledge and judgment to have safely traveled from star to star. Now, hidden in that, I think, is, is something that is really important. We are really isolated. We, we talk about moving around our own solar system, and, and, and that's brilliant. But effectively, we're isolated on our planet pretty much, and we're certainly isolated or quarantined in our own solar system at present. Next slide, please. So the idea of habitable planets wasn't known back in 1972, but since then, there's lots of examples of, of, uh, of other planets, exoplanets. So we have over 6,000 now at this stage. And this view graph gives an example of two that myself and Roy had been looking at. There's lots to choose from, of course. Um, the first is Proxima Centauri, if you look down on the bottom right, because it is the closest star to the Earth at 4.2 light years, and it does have a planet going around it. Another example that was particularly of interest to myself and Roy at the time, because this is going back five years now when we were writing this initial paper, was TRAPPIST-1. And TRAPPIST-1 is at 39 light years, both relatively close. Uh, so we're not talking about thousands of light years or hundreds of light years. So these are very much in our, in our cosmic neighborhood. And so we've got uh, something that we didn't realize in 1972 at least these two targets. Now there's lots more, but these are the two. Obviously, I'm not going to talk about 5,000 targets or anything like that. So these are two that we knew might be of interest. So we go to the next slide, please. Some of you might remember about TRAPPIST-1. There was a lot in the paper at the time because it has uh, seven planets going around it. And of those seven planets, we've marked here five, which are potentially in the habitable zone. Probably all of you are familiar with this idea of the Goldilocks zone, and there's been a lot of talk in more recent times about you know, misinterpretations of what we mean by or how we get a Goldilocks zone. Mm -hmm. So if we take our own solar system before going back to TRAPPIST-1, you know, we have <clears throat> Venus, Earth and Mars all in the Goldilocks zone. But we know that Venus is incredibly hot. Um, 400 degrees centigrade, Mars is minus 50 degrees centigrade, and, and Earth is, is just right. And, and so we know that actually making something that is in the habitable zone habitable um, is, is not a given. And we actually think that a lot of the reason why the Earth is habitable is because our atmosphere is moderated by life. So mm -hmm. Venus, we think, doesn't have any life. We, 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 We've, we've seen comments about life in, in the upper atmosphere and so on and floating life and lots of interesting comments around that but it doesn't it certainly doesn't have systemic life that that has um you know set foot or or, or gained a ground uh, in some in some consistent way on the planet mars may have we know uh, that mars may have looked a lot better at one stage. In fact, we know it did in terms of habitability but we also know that mars was simply too small to hold on to its, to its atmosphere, it doesn't have a magnetic field. So a combination of not having a magnetic field and having low mass means that the solar wind is, is inevitably going to, to blow your atmosphere away. And of course, we know if you don't have an atmosphere and you have no greenhouse gas um, <clears throat> effect, and so you have no way of distributing the heat around your, your planet. And so you're either you know, one side really hot, the other side really cold, or you're just cold the whole time or whatever. So it, it, making something in a habitable zone is difficult. So although we, we, we think that these seven planets might be in the habitable zone, we have no idea what their atmospheres are like at the moment in enough detail to know whether or not the, the temperatures on those planets would be moderated in a way that would allow liquid water to exist. And liquid water, by the way, is one of those things which is a is a constraint as far as we can tell that is required for life. So if I look at life in the universe, any of us look at life universe, that means life on our home planet, of course, at the moment, then one thing that is true of all life forms is that they all use water. <clears throat> some, some require an atmosphere, some don't, and um, some require sunlight, some don't, but they all require water. And they have to have water in a liquid form if they're to reproduce 
or to be sort of life of you can put them frozen of course and, and then nothing happens so if you want to be sort of alive then, then you, need, you need to have liquid water so it's not unreasonable on that basis that we would look for liquid water as a potential place um, um, uh, to, to, uh, as a potential requirement to, to, to call something a habitable zone. Next slide, please, Andy. Proxima B, I mentioned it just to say very quickly that it is situated in the habitable zone and it is around the closest known exoplanet to our solar system. If we go to the next slide, that's interesting to us, thanks Andy, because if you are close then obviously you have the benefit of things for example like the vlt or maybe obviously coming the eelt and um, the european extremely large telescope which allows you to do high resolution spectroscopy from the ground uh, you, you you can't do everything from the ground of course the atmosphere prevents you from looking at certain wavelengths but because it's close you get a higher resolution in your image which means you can tell more about the atmosphere. If we go to the next slide, you can of course supplement that then with the likes of um, the James Webb Space Telescope, which can do things twofold. And I think the, the key thing here, just to, to note for the purposes of this with the, with the JWST, is that it allows us to see in a different wavelength range than we can see from the ground. It doesn't give us higher resolution, for example, in the optical, but it doesn't give us good resolution in the optical at all, but it extends our wavelength range into the infrared. The reason why that's important is water, for example, has a, has a large absorption in the infrared, whereas it's pretty much transparent in the optical. I mean, you can tell that for the most part because our atmosphere all the time has a has a good deal of water vapor in it, but we, we can still see the sky above us and so forth. So we know that water vapor in terms of the visible part of the spectrum is fairly transparent. Now, it, it, the, the, it, it can change if it, for example, freezes or in the case of clouds, if you get sort of dust particles mixed in with it and so forth or aerosols but so we need to go into wavelengths which which are which are different to just being able to see from the ground but Roy and me thought we said okay with with the James Webb coming online with um with the European extremely large telescope coming online we're going to be able to see the atmospheres of these stars ever more uh, sorry planets ever more with high resolution from the earth I thought you now that's interesting because that starts to tell us which ones might be habitable because once, going back to the conversation of a moment ago, once we can tell something about the atmospheres, we can model whether we think that, that the temperature on the surface is likely for liquid water. And once that's the case, now it becomes a really exciting possible destination for a spacecraft. We haven't got to the spacecraft bit yet, but we will momentarily. So next slide, please. Andy. So if we just ask about what we know, Proxima Centauri, this is a very, very busy slide. And really just, I wanted to, for the purpose of this evening, if we just look at the bottom right bullet point and um, taking all the information, e even though the, the, the planet itself is around a, an, a red dwarf star, a much smaller star, it's, it's so close to that star that its surface temperature, so this bottom right bullet point is between modeling why so we don't we haven't measured this directly now so this this is modeling of what we think could be the situation on proxima b somewhere between minus 46 and plus 30. now it could be outside of those bounds as well but these are high likelihood bounds that the the temperature is between those two clearly if it's on the lower end it's problematic if it's on the upper end it, it, it isn't because we're well within the operating temperature of liquid water and also the operating temperature of life on, on this planet. So Proxima Centauri, if you're thinking, where do I want to go if I'm going to seed the universe? So if I'm directing, if I'm using directed panspermia, the word directed means I'm going to target where I'm going to go. Well, Proxima B isn't the worst place to, to imagine that you might go to because it may actually have a nice surface temperature. Next. Actually, there's one other thing, by the way. It's also an old, the, the, the star itself is old. It's about the same age as the sun, a couple of hundred million years older. And we know that it took life a couple of billion years before it got started on the Earth. 
Um, so the sun was about three billion years old before before um, life st- sort of started, the very earliest life starts on the earth. So if we so we need to find stars that aren't very very new, stars that are you know a few hundred million years old. The likelihood, even if they had a good planet around, the likelihood is they're they're too young to have had time for. Well, when I say the likelihood, based upon a single data point, which is the Earth, which really doesn't give us a likelihood at all, but based upon what happened on the Earth, it, there wouldn't be there wouldn't be enough time in a couple of hundred million years to generate life. The planet would need to settle down a lot more. But Proxima B has had time to settle down. So next slide, please, Andy. So the other really fascinating thing, and this blows my mind every time I think about it, is that since 1972, so we've discovered there's exoplanets but since 1972 we've done something else and many of you may not be familiar with this guy craig ventner if you're into astronomy like me you're more likely to know or less likely to know craig ventner and more likely to know carl sagan but he he wrote sometime in the future i'm a hundred percent certain scientists will sit down at a computer terminal design what they want the organism to do and build it and he wrote that in 2007. if you go on to the next slide please It was three years later in 2010 that Ventner and his team actually did that. And they called it the first, they call it JCVI SYN1 for synthetic version one. Um, uh, By the way, astronomers are great for their, for their names. Um, uh, You know, sometimes we get accused of being, being boring by calling things, you know, the moon lander or whatever. And and, and that's it. But I think the biologists, you know, uh, trump us, for having things that we just have no idea what the acronym stands for. But the 1.0 is the one thing to focus on for the next couple of slides, because that number is going to change from a one to another number. So the first living organism on Earth whose parent is a computer. So this is an image of that first living organism. Um, and what Ventner and his and his, his team did was they they went in and they they altered the structure the, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a piece of DNA from that bacteria. It took out the, the, the DNA from the, the, the cell center. Now, remember, I'm not a biologist. So for those biologists who might be here, you might be thinking, ooh, that use of language isn't exactly how I describe it. But they took the, 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 the DNA from, the, from, the, 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 center, from the, the cell, the nucleus of the cell. They altered that DNA so that the cell would behave differently and they put it back in. But the altering of that cell was determined on a computer. So they basically decided about what they needed to splice out, what what changes they need to make, and then they reintroduced that uh, nuclei into the cell and the cell behaved differently. Now, it's really important to, to point out that this was done in a very, um, first of all, a safe environment, um, but also with an intention to to, to to not sort of turn us into some sort of Frankenstein. These things don't grow into into big complicated organisms. They remain as as these um, multicellular, but, 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 but very simple organisms. We go on to the next slide, please. So that was 2010. By 2015, the, the, the number had gone from one to three. And if you look in the middle, you'll see highlighted 473 genes. And this becomes something that's really important. So a typical bacteria, contains between 1,500 and 7,500 genes. For us humans, our DNA contains about 35,000 genes. And um, seems like we should be a lot more than that. Doesn't, doesn't seem like we're far enough away from bacteria to be comfortable. Um, <laughs> so maybe there's a lesson in there for us all. But actually, DNA is one of the, it's like these things that it's, it's like a Rubik's cube. You know, the possible number of combinations is enormous. So once you start to sort of, double the number of genes, the number of possible combinations of things you can do with that goes up exponentially. But what Ventner and his team did back in 2015 was they they looked at uh, very closely um, at, at how DNA operates and they determined that there were 473 genes. And remember, genes are things that do things like they give you your eye color, your hair color, or, you know, whether you have f- five fingers or whether your fingers are a lot, like, all your fundamental physical characteristics are determined by genes and and and, and much else as well, of course. Um, but they determined that there's 473 genes that are critical for a bacterium to exist. So although most bacteria contain between 1,500 and 7,500 genes, it turns out that only 473 of those are vital for life. 
So the others are doing something on top of that. So that's a really interesting discovery. Well, it certainly was for me as a physicist. I didn't realize this. So there's this like engine in the middle. And if we go to the next slide, I think it's nicely illustrated on, on the next slide. So on the left, we have a rather scary looking scientist doing rather scary work, although well, in, in guest sponsored by Lego, but th 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 which isn't a bad thing if they're going to sponsor some research. But in this instance, they're, they're working in the lab. And what they've done is um, uh, uh, is to, to generate the device, uh, the, the car on the right-hand side. Now, if you look at it, there's two elements to that particular car. There's a chassis underneath it. So you've got the wheels and the chassis. And then you've got this, it's an SUV type type vehicle. So in, in essence, the chassis of that car is the 473 genes. It's the, the bit of the engine, it's the wheels, because that's what you need if you want a car. It has to be able to go somewhere. Otherwise, it's not a car. But what the car does then, whether it's it's this, whether it's a truck, whether it's a Maserati, whether it's a bus or whatever, that's contained in all the genes beyond 473. So by 2015, we had now got to a stage where we could understand how, in principle, and actually not just in principle, and this is why I think it's mind-blowing, how we could take the fundamental gene building block and build on it so that we could essentially turn that into whatever we wanted to. Now, every time I, 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 I do this, I think I still think this is, is astonishing. We're hearing a lot at the moment about artificial intelligence. It's all, it's everywhere and, and all its implications. But it seems to me that this quiet revolution about our understanding of fundamentally how we build organisms. So my, when, when my colleague Roy Slater said this to me, and this going back to the early part of my conversation, he's a biologist, I'm a physicist, and I just don't know 99.99% of .99 what Roy does, and maybe similarly in the other direction. He was saying to me, yeah, yeah, but this is obvious like too. So then when we actually put the two together, we start to get this, some really interesting conversations. And I hope you're still with me now in relation to the conversation. So we go on to the next slide. We start to see how we start to put this together um, in, in, into something that we now call bioforming. You're probably thinking, Niall, you spend 20 minutes, eventually you've got to, to telling us bioforming. So we've quoted a number of other people, but one of the in one of our papers we asked, well, what happens if we build organisms that are tailored to it to thrive in extreme conditions. So in that sentence, there's a few things hidden. If we build, us, humans, if we build organisms tailored to thrive in extreme conditions. So if you're thriving in extreme conditions, actually to you, that's not an extreme condition. That's what you need to thrive. So we start to move into this era where we think about, okay, now it is actually possible to, to make organisms that behave in a predictable way that are based on DNA, that use the laws of physics, chemistry, biology that we know, but instead of lo loving Earth with its, with its you know, atmospheric pressure, the way, well, maybe forget the atmospheric pressure because some organisms live in the bottom of the sea and so on. But if you, if, if you look at it, the, very, the, 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 the different types of conditions that exist on the Earth, but we can build organisms that look at completely different conditions and potentially thrive. So we go on to the next slide and we can get a sense of that then, the terraforming to bioforming. One second. Does anyone get a chance? Sorry. You're probably... I lost my mouse. No? Okay. No, no, thank you, Andy. So if we take this as terraforming, so just to explain what terraforming is. So if we start on the, the left-hand side, you have a lifeless planet, so it's barren. In terraforming, you modify the planet. So that's sort of stage two. And modifying the planet, for example, you see conversations, you see Elon Musk, you see NASA, you see others talking about reintroducing um, oxygen to, or releasing oxygen um, from, from the surface of Mars and modifying Mars and then introducing life in the next piece uh, as we know it. And that's important. So it's life as we know it um, into that a world which has already been terraformed so we've changed it so that it it can it can take life and then we go on to the final uh, of those which is life evolves on the planet which we have made habitable so we tried to make that planet look like earth effectively because earth is where earth's organisms thrive go on to the next slide let's think of this 
differently. So now we start to talk about bioforming. And this is where we modify the terrestrial organism to suit the planet, not the other way around. So if we look at the, the uh, in the middle, the, 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 this isn't animated in, in um, right at the minute. So just bear with me. If we look at the planet in the middle, uh, and, and what we're done here is we're showing radio telescope examining it. We're showing satellites examining it. We're getting a sense of what are the conditions on that planet. That's the, that's the first blue circle um, in, in, towards the bottom left. Then if we move to the right, what we do is we take that information and we say, ah, okay, it's a very heavily, let's say, CO2. The temperature is this or very methane or whatever. Let's make, make a microorganism which actually thrives under those conditions. So we, 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 we generate that in the computer. So that's the zeros and ones. We then convert that into DNA code. That's the, that's the letters, the GAC, TT, and so on. And then from that, we make DNA strands. So you can kind of see um, elements there in, in the top right. You've got sort of a red, a, a, a blue, and a, a greeny. It might not come out so much greeny, and a black sort of oval. And then what we do is th their actual DNA, which we then put into, into cells. And then those cells, instead of being, uh, because now the, the, the nuclei of those um, have, been, have been changed in the way that Craig Ventner and his team were able to do that originally. So those now love the idea of living on a methane or a carbon dioxide planet. And so what we now do is we take those and we drop them onto the planet. So if we go on to the next slide, what we then get is this idea that you take the barren, the lifeless world, you introduce life that is synthesized. So the life finds itself on that planet and is perfectly happy to be there. It's thinking, great, I love being on this planet. The life itself then modifies the planet just like life on Earth modified this planet. And Roy and me reckon for reasons that I won't go into here, also in part because I probably want Roy to say it, but that we would accelerate the evolution perhaps by a thousand times than natural selection would do. So you end up with the possibility of changing a planet. And that then um, opens up all sorts of interesting possibilities which you may, may, may not get a chance to, to chat to about tonight, just keeping an eye on the time. So the next slide, please, Andy. So if we take this targeted approach to bioforming, then something really interesting happens. In Crick and Oracle, they needed this thousand kilograms. So think of this entire van. And it, that can all get shrunk down into less than 100 grams. In fact, uh, we reckon that you can get that down to less than a gram. So uh, with these modified organisms, um, you, can, you can achieve with less than a gram, what would require a thousand kilograms if you go with the microorganism route. So next slide, please. So that is really important because we've gone from having a really heavy payload to a really light payload. And actually we've gone from having a really heavy payload, which would really love to find an earth planet to a very light payload, which actually is synthesized to really be happy with the destination that we've chosen for it. So since 1972, we've also recognized ways of getting there. And the phrase from Sagan, we are ready at last to set sail for the stars. And actually sail is an important point here. So if we go on to the next slide, please. We know that traditionally we've used sail to move around the planet. Um, and of course, we, we went away from that um, particular propulsion mechanism. But it starts to come back um, as, as have, having certain interests. We, by the way, we've seen even some ships uh, using uh, that, that are diesel powered uh, that are using sail to, to reduce their carbon footprint by 10 or 20 percent being used now for transatlantic and, 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 and global trade, which is really interesting. But also we've seen some space cars. So if we go to the next slide, we see the Planetary Society's light sail project where they where they, um, where they uh, launched um, with, with private funding a, a satellite that unfurled a large um, uh, sail in, in, in an effectively identical manner that we've just seen on the previous slide, but using the pressure from the, the emission from the sun, so the solar wind, to, to push on that. Um, and because you've got particles in the solar wind, but you've also got light from the solar wind. Um, because light exerts a very small moment, has a very small momentum. And if you've got momentum, you exert a very small force on something. And if you exert a, a force on anything, you accelerate it. It's the, 
the definition of a force. So, so that force helps to accelerate this light light sail. So you 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 end up literally, you know, using sailing around the solar system, and probably many of you will be familiar with that. So the idea of sails got us also thinking about the next slide, please, Andy, which was the idea, which was this breakthrough starship. For those of you who aren't familiar with, it's a it's a project funded by uh, philanthropically. And the idea is to try to come up with a mechanism whereby um, you will be able to accelerate um, spacecraft up to very high velocities so that they will be able to get to other planets in, in time scales, which are several hundreds of thousands of times shorter than we currently can do. So this graphic shows the kind of, the, because I won't go into any of the background detail, but the idea is you have a lot of lasers all pointing up in the sky. And if you go on to the next slide, please, uh, Andy. These particular lasers then are directed at a very small sail, which might be um, only a, a few centimeters by a few centimeters. But the pressure of all of that light from from that, and all of those, and, and and a critical thing here is that that light, each of the each of the the, the the photons of light in that is traveling by definition at the speed of light, so they're able to, in principle, accelerate that light sail because they're themselves traveling very fast. They're in principle able to accelerate that sail up to a very high speed. So if we go on to the next slide, please, Andy. But to get it up to a very high speed, your payload has to be ridiculously small. So off the order of a gram, a couple of grams. I think up to five grams is the sort of numbers that, that I'm seeing. Now, five grams is very small. And if you take the quick and orgal approach, well, a thousand kilograms, you just you can't get it up to the sorts of speeds which we'll come to in just a second as, as an example, but a, a significant percentage of the speed of light. You can't do it with a thousand kilograms. We, we, we have no way of knowing. But you might be able to do it with five grams of a spacecraft. And what if four grams of that were your control electronics and so on, leaving one gram for the payload? But now going back to the earlier argument, that one gram could contain uh, the, the, the same amount of, of microorganisms, the, the, the DNA from those that would uh, allow us to see that DNA on another on another world. So we go on to the next slide, please. So if we if we if we take then Proxima B, and if you go to the next slide, or at least hopefully you'll, we'll th this slide will change, Andy. Um, let's just see. Okay, it didn't. So that that was just I'm afraid an, an, an issue with um, with the way it's being displayed here. So if we just go back for one second, and I'll just try to explain it because there's actually a small piece missing. So 4.2 light years. If you imagine going between the Earth and Proxima B, it would take about 78,000 years for the Voyager spacecraft, either the Voyager spacecraft, to get there. Whereas if you use this breakthrough Starship approach, which gets you up to about 20% of the speed of light. Now, this has not been attempted yet. There's no experiment to, to prove that this is possible, but there's a lot of interesting work being done on this. And again, going back to the very beginning of the presentation, in principle, it's possible to do this. The engineering may be horrendously complicated, but the laws of physics allow you to do this. Well, if we had the view graph there, you would see that getting from the Earth to Proxima B would take about 20 years. So you've changed from 78,000 years down to 20 years. Of course, if your light sail doesn't go quite as fast, maybe it's 40 years or 60 years or 100 years. Now, when you get to 100 years, um, it's not that people lose interest, but of course, you're outside of standard lifetimes and so on. And so 100 years is, is probably starts to get it to being a sort of a legacy experiment. If you can do it in 20, 30, 40 years, now it's interesting because people are saying, I'm, I wonder what will happen because I'm going to be there to see it. So it's just interesting to try to see the, the, the time scales that, that might attach to it. Go on to the next slide, please. So if we look then in, in the Milky Way, we, we, we've seen that the nearest 2,000 stars, if you look at the bottom left there, the nearest 2,000 stars are reachable with this proposed technology in less than 300 years. So in less than 300 years, we could, in principle, have selected from 2,000 stars. And actually, those 2,000 stars almost all have planets around them. 
Whether they're habitable or not, we don't know yet. That piece of the information is not filled in, but we're making rapid progress on being able to understand and determine the planetary atmospheres and model what the surface temperatures are like and whether there'll be water on them or not. But that's 2000 within, within less than 300 years. So you start to think about the fact that we have a reasonable number of options to send and to bioform. So next slide, please. But should we? So that's an obvious question because let's just think for one second or coming just to the, the end of, of the, the, the presentation now in the next couple of minutes. Um, uh, the, the, what we've actually said here is that there, there is a possibility for us to take organisms, synthesize them, uh, and that we can do on this planet. We now know we can do that. Um, we know that we're getting a better sense uh, from our new uh, from new instruments on the ground and in space of what the conditions on different planets are. We know there's lots of planets out there now, and we're starting to explore these new propulsion technologies, which will get us up to to um, speeds which were inconceivable, and actually still at the minute are inconceivable. But the critical thing is they're not disallowed by the laws of the universe. The, 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 the principle is sound. People like Stephen Hawking were associated uh, with, the star, with the breakthrough starship, for example. So giving some credibility, if you like, to the underlying physics. Oh, there's, there's enormous problems still to be overcome, but that, that was, that's always been true of, of major advances. Next slide, please. So the question of should we now starts to become something which we or maybe our kids or our grandkids need to start to think about. Should we bioform? So Crick and Orville's view was under no circumstances should we risk infecting other planets at the present time. Stephen Hawking, just as a counterexample, he's just two examples. Our only chance of long-term survival is not to remain inward looking on the planet Earth, but to spread out into space. So for example, you could conceive a situation where we prepare a planet, should we? We prepare a lifeless planet, could we be sure it's lifeless? Do we have the right to do that so that when our sun expands in five billion years time and, and you know comes to encircle the Earth and so on and really make it uninhabitable, that we'd have a destination to go to that we would have already prepared for ourselves. I understand this is incredibly speculative, but it's interesting that even if we don't do that, there's some other possibilities. So if we go to the next slide, please. So the question, it's a couple of questions in these just two slides. One is when we look at going to the likes of Mars and so on, um, we often see people in spacesuits and, and that's fine. But would you actually want to live on a planet where it was the red bit at the bottom? That's the earth I would see in the background. Would you want to live on that? I think all the evidence suggests really in the long term, no. People's health and well-being require us to be able to do things that we have evolved to do. Being in a spacesuit all the time or in enclosed structures all the time, in environments which are extreme and which want to kill you all the time, are not environments in which you're going to build a civilization. You're much more likely to need to do something with that environment so that you know you have air and temperature and so on that allows you to be mobile in that environment rather than effectively a prisoner in spacesuits. But the second, if we want to the next slide, uh, please, Andy. Of course, the question is, why do we have to bioform worlds for us? Why not bioform worlds that will then be the best there is for, um, for for grass, for example. I mean, we can make worlds that don't uh, aren't good for you and me particularly, but are good for other species. I think this is something that's really important about climate change. And when we talk about climate change, because climate change and we talk about biodiversity and so on, what, what we kind of really know from the past is that whatever we do, There'll be some to, to, to the to the current biodiversity, whatever we do to the condition of this planet, there'll be some biodiversity which is delighted that we've done that. There will be other things which will thrive and take over, just like the dinosaurs exited stage left. Other things will take advantage of that. That's not a rationale 
I'm not advocating for us to be careless with our climate, but I'm just saying that we have other possible Earths that would be very attractive to other possible life forms. Now, I don't mean weird life forms. They'd be based around DNA and so on. They would they would use all the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology, but they, they wouldn't be you and me, for example. But we have this really interesting possibility of taking barren planets and bringing them alive for other types of organisms. Just an interesting one. Next slide, please. But the one thing that we can be sure of is that while bioforming is allowed by the laws of the universe, empire building is not. So when we, in, just to finish in a minute and a half, when people, when we might think, oh, well, okay, we're now going to see the entire universe and ruin the entire universe. Well, we're not. So we go to the next slide, please, Andy. If we look at our local galactic group, well, that is 5 million years across, 5 million light years across. So um, even at the speed of light, that's uh, that's going to take us five five million years to go across. So you kind of think, well, maybe that's possible. We won't get to the speed of light, but if we're getting ten percent of the speed of light, that's fifty million years. We can kind of explore the local galactic group. So if we go to the next slide, please, Andy. If we go to our Virgo supercluster, which is our local supercluster, that's a hundred million light years. That's going to get. That's going to take us a thousand million years. It's a billion years to get across. That's beginning to sound like it's stretching the interest of the funding agency that's going to fund that particular um, exploration. If we go the next slide, please, Andy, then we go to the local superclusters, which is a billion light years. So now we're into 10 billion years just to get across it, let alone do anything interesting. And that really has already got to the taking us to the age pretty much of the current universe just to get across our Virgo supercluster. So if we go to the next scale of the universe, then of course the observable universe as we know it today is 92 billion light years. And notwithstanding expansion of the universe and all sorts of other horrendous problems, we're never going to build an empire in our universe. This bioforming, this idea of affecting is always going to be localized in the, in the universe around us. Most of our universe will only ever be contactable in some sense by the electromagnetic radiation we receive from it. We, we, unless the, the speed of light is somehow at some point proven to be n not a barrier, and everything suggests it is, we're really stuck in, in this local neighborhood. It's not a reason to go and just transform planets or bioform planets willy-nilly, but we're never going to do it for the entire universe. There's going to be plenty of other biodiversity. So just to finish off with the last slide, um, then, and, and I thought that the slide would get mixed up because it was three slides, which then get, get get put onto other when we did the upload. So we've gone from could we become an alien species that we once feared to should we become an alien species that we once feared? And well done if you can read that from the top two lines. But the question is that, yes, should we? And I, I, I leave that to you and maybe a conversation now. So I leave it with that and uh, thank you for, for listening. Thank you very much, Niall. Uh, absolutely fascinating stuff. Uh, I'd like to ask the panel to show their appreciation in the customary fashion. So oh, very good. Well done, Niall. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, the first time I saw this, I I was uh, really engrossed, and I'm still engrossed in it. Really interesting yeah, topic. Yeah. We've got a couple of uh, a question here from Ian, um, and Ian says. Uh, does now think that other civilizations out there have already done this? Could Earth be an example of an alien bioformed planet? Think 2001. Yeah, so I, I'm probably as, as qualified, Ian, as you to actually give an answer to that. But I think the, the, uh, the, the possibility that that would have been done um, exists. And, and I think what we, re what we understand now is that, is that possibility exists. Um, the uh, but we, we have simply no way of, of connecting it back at the moment because all the conditions, all the molecules um, uh, required to build DNA exist on the Earth. So we don't need to bring anything from elsewhere. There's nothing strange in those in in, in those atoms and molecules. Now, quite frankly, there's nothing strange. Those atoms and molecules just are replicated time and time again across the universe. So. So there's no way to 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 connect in a a a, a, 
a signature from another world into anything that we we find on our own planet that is somehow different, if you like, from, let's say, um, so, so we don't find a different form of carbon, for example, that we only find in life that we don't find existing in, in non-life forms. We, we just see the same molecules everywhere. So there's no way to decouple the origins of those. M my kind of sense, it would be actually, yeah, I was going to speculate, but it would be just hor horrible speculation. My kind of sense is possibly not. But I think we're at a stage now where we realize it, it is a possibility. Um, and if somebody says we were visited by something in a UFO, I think that's one line of, um, and I know you didn't suggest that, Ian, but that's one line of conversation which you can probably discount. But you really, we really can't discount the possibility of, of organisms being moving around the, around the universe. Incidentally, it's, it, we certainly, almost certainly, I should say, have moved organisms between the Earth and Mars between the Earth and Venus, between the Earth and Mercury, possibly even further out than that as well. I mean, mm. it's it's sort of inconceivable that 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 we haven't already shared. We 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 know this. We've certainly seen lots of sharing of Mike Mars meteorites, for example, this direction. Um, it, <coughs> it's almost inconceivable that we wouldn't have done something in the other direction. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, um, just so, all of, so Steve um, just put in said, really fascinating and interesting talk. Didn't understand the ultimate purpose until the end. It is that if we are the only life, then we can create a galaxy-wide experimental laboratory. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, a, it's very uh, speculative. Um, uh, well, I, I'm glad to hear right at, towards the end, because I was thinking... You know, uh, it was fascinating to hear what, how this has all come about, the, the thought process and things like that. And I was a bit concerned. I got to the place where I was, the ethics of it. And as you said, you all you covered that towards the end, which is I'm glad to know that people are sort of like thinking along this line. Mm. That um, if it's if the place is actually possibly, uh, you know, open to have uh, to be in. Uh, colonized then there could be something there already and do we have the right to interfere <clears throat> with what's already going on um yeah. so yeah i'm glad that's uh, the thinking along but of course, of course when you were talking about distances and all that um really what we need is what they call bracewell probes which are um autonomous um artificial intelligence machines that fly around the earth they basically they just leave the solar system and they do all the work they basically go there they're uh, self uh, thinking um they will analyze the planet they will decide what whether or not it it could be habitized and they, then they could possibly drop something down there just to do it and that so um but again the bracewell probe that's sort of like a hypothetical thing at the moment but the way um artificial intelligence is going um, then maybe um, something like that could uh, could really um, happen. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. Well, very I, I, think, I think it's interesting that um, uh, it, it is. It was incredibly expensive to uh, synthesize DNA in into something different, um, but it has now become something that that about ten years ago, you know, it's 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 almost like the old. A computer in you know the early days of the computer you needed mm -hmm. an entire room air conditioned to cost you a million dollars or whatever and we've now got to be able to synthesize it um in in, in a couple of hours in a, in a in a device that's no more the size of a shoebox and you can do it for a thousand dollars so so you 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 the this whole gene so we, we we hear a lot about gene therapy um and 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 what what that can, can do positive and and potentially negative so what we're seeing is this huge evolution um, and and back to your bracelet machines the, the the idea that you would have an artificial intelligence in fact Roy and me discussed this a little bit that that in, on the spacecraft you would have something which would look down in close proximity to the planet would then use on board and make on board and drop that mm -hmm. down so exactly what you're saying as uh, which is the the the, the this idea of um uh, of of uh, of doing it in situ, um, and the great thing about DNA is it's a pretty stable molecule. So you just take this batch with you, 
and then you you know you you change it when you get there and and you you then put it into cells and and, and you drop those down um, and and off you go so we're not we're not generating life here by the way from no life i think that's a really important point um while we're right on the edge when i say we have nothing to do with me but as a species we we haven't actually generated life but we have completely altered the fundamentals of what that life form is doing and um, so from that perspective we're we're yeah. we're, 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 we're uh, Changing. Yeah, uh, Steve Warby says, "Might we need to bioform Earth species to withstand climate change?" Mm. Mm. It's a good yeah. point. Yeah, I, actually, and and Steve, I think the thing is, what, again, one of the conversations that I was having was that that that's almost certainly happening anyway amongst you know, uh, like not not you and me because our evolution time scale and our replication time scale is very long. But if you're if you're a bacterium and so on, you're 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 just evolving and you're you're mm -hmm. adapting, you know, post haste. So so it's it, it's almost certainly going on, and that's why the biodiversity we have biodiversity loss for sure. We also have biodiversity gain in 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 into new organisms. And we're seeing organisms behave very differently as a result of climate change. Um, yeah. I, I, it maybe it's a, it's a unfashionable to say this because I'm totally in favor. By the way, this isn't the unfashionable bit. I'm totally in favor of protecting the planet for our kids and our grandkids and all the rest. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about you know destroying the air, we we, we always leave out the bit of for us, you know, because that's yeah. the underlying point is we're worried mm -hmm. that we will be damaged by it. Um, and I also think there's a bit of an ethical disconnect there between those yeah. two conversations. You know, we've assumed yeah, because, um, it would be mean, good for us. People talk about us destroying the planet. We're mm. not. The planet will be just fine. Mm. They're talking about destroying our way of life. That's really what they're, they're yeah. talking about. That, that's correct, yeah. By the yeah. way, we are already selectively breeding more temperature-resistant, um, well, um, heat-resistant corals to repopulate coral reefs. So... The program's already underway. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Can I just say as well that um, I've never personally been a fan of uh, terraforming other planets, um, mainly because of how we've treated our planet as a species mm. uh, over the millennia. Um, perhaps uh, bioforming is um, a way, you know, to kind of track that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Go, sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, indeed. Yeah, it's very thought provoking, isn't it? It's a very uh, interesting subject, and we may come back to this sometime. And, and very, very know, good. Um, it is amazing, but it, it doesn't surprise me. But it is amazing how such interesting studies can come out of a basically a water cooler conversation. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can I can I just add um, one thing? Um, I studied biotechnology, so I know I I know a little bit about what's going on with DNA and things and. Uh, I just have to add that uh, life is awfully more complex than we tend to think it is, especially ecosystems. And, uh, and um, you know, while we do have this sort of idea uh, that, you know, that Neil, you've, you've presented uh, the, just the complexity of, of, of sort of even fathoming of trying to bring about uh, sort of viable uh, and balanced uh, ecosystem into a new pla planet is just it's just really far beyond what we can potentially do at the moment but you know the long term vision is there and uh, i'd just like to add the famous sentence from a famous film life finds the way life finds a way right yeah, and happening. whatever we're going to dump on these inert bodies planetary bodies you know in nearby solar systems anything might happen you know if we just leave it there and and who knows so yeah, yeah. thanks again for the talk Neil. Well, no, and you're absolutely right and by the way I, I i hope i made it clear about the speculative nature even though mm. in the sense of when we might achieve this what just has got me fascinated which is why i'm kind of fascinated with just sharing with others is that uh these things start to seem to become you know uh, possible is probably too strong a word but but allowable and so you know you think wow that's actually you know the pace of change is is enormous and, and i i just love the idea of being excited about the pace of change but then we also need to think a little bit about what 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 um what might be the consequences of that and not sort of sleepwalk into it because i suppose so you i totally totally agree with you and then and 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 on a follow on that then you think well you know suppose it takes a million years to, to do some of these things but like you know like the earth is already four and a half billion years old like a million years sounds an awful long time but it's going to happen there will 
there yeah. will be a million years hence and you just kind of think you know what what might things look like and at the moment it's this is not going to happen in our lifetimes or whatever or something yeah. like that but also just because i, I if, if i'm be, being honest just it's a personal fascination but we have a uh at the observatory we do a lot of work with outreach with kids and so on and we want to get them to to think broadly and, and to try to bring ethical considerations mm -hmm. into what they're thinking with what's possible and also then you know it was one of the reasons why i i always mention about the speed of light because you don't want to then just do the kind of saying and your brain just all over and everything is possible because everything isn't possible and actually there was an interesting question about the moon there and bioforming on the moon um which just dropped off i, I couldn't see who who, who, who that was in? Sandra. Sandra. Was it Sandra? Sorry, Sandra. Ab 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 apologies. But um, so, uh, you know, I, I think what, what's interesting is you see life forms existing on the outside of the International Space Station, you know. Mm -hmm. So th there's, there's no doubt that life forms uh, could be those or, or other ones. And, 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 you know, a really good point if we dump life, dump life on the moon or something probably something would figure a way to survive there anyway you know if you look at a, what's the problem with the moon well you've got i suppose three things one there's no air but that's that's not critical for life actually two is the temperature extremes between night and day now that that's a problem unless you're kind of on the sweet spots you know the south pole where the temperature variation is a bit less and obviously a lot of interest in that and, and the third is the radiation, because the moon has, has no magnetic field. Mm. But we see organisms that live down deep in the mines <laughs> in South Africa that actually live off radiation. That's their energy source is radiation. So you kind of think, well, actually, there's nothing about the moon to completely preclude the sites, the sites of any kind of organisms that we might actually already know exist. So it's it's a it's it, it, it's certainly in certain parts of it. So it's an it's an in, it's an interesting one. I, and I'm, I I don't accept too far out of my, outside my my uh, my own area of of any sort of knowledge on this and say something which is patently wrong but that strikes mm. me as something that already we can do kind of you know the, the possibilities of, of yeah absolutely uh, absolutely natural bioforming okay so i think we'll start drawing things uh, to a close for the yeah. season we'd obviously like to be give a huge thank you to yeah, thank you. Niall for yeah. his, his exceptionally uh, i would clap at the moment but i've got a cat sitting on my arm uh, <laughs> So, um, so uh, yeah, um, is, uh, thank you so much, Nal, for, for taking the time to be with us this evening. And, um, you know, as I said to you, you're welcome back any time. Just drop in. Um, so uh, you know yeah. where we are and you know what time. So uh, if and if, if you would like to come and do another presentation for us on whatever subject, you're always welcome. So, well, well, thank you. And, and and just so everybody knows, it's it's it, everything that, that, that I'm interested in, if, for example, in, in, well, in listening to you, I thought today has been brilliant. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I will definitely be joining in future, Andy. But um, yeah, there's lots of topics which are uh, which that I'm interested in, which are more mainstream than this. So this is a fascination, a side fascination that I yeah. have, which mm. came from that water cooler conversation. It's not what I spend most of my time on. Mm. But I think it's just nice every now and again, just I hope, I hope that's the way it came across. It's just just a bit different. Um, oh, yeah, sure. But, but allowable. I keep on going back to that point, but at least allowable in some sense, as yeah. a thing of just being silly speculation yeah, that has right. no that's basis right. in, and, in science. Um, mm -hmm. yes, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you in the future. Now. Well, all great advancements start from a small idea, don't they? So. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, because it is our mission here on Space Oddities to bring the universe to everybody and, uh, you know, as many different aspects of it as we possibly can. Yeah. Next week, viewers, in fact, um, we've got Robin Egger, who will be talking about uh, researching the influence of eclipses on ancient cultures. So that uh, that looks to be an interesting evening as well. We hope you can join us for that. I'd like to say thank you to the panel for being here this evening. Uh, we seem to have lost Pete. Uh, yeah, he, he had visitors turn up. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. All right, then. Um, lovely to see you again, Bernard. Don't be a stranger. Join us when you can and um, and keep in touch. Michael, I hope your thumb gets better, mate. Can we? Yeah, have, yeah there we you. are. <laughs> <laughs> You're like a permanent Paul McCartney, aren't you? Uh, so, um, so. Uh, yeah, so four, four, four weeks with this. <laughs> four, four weeks. I know. Did, did, did they. Um, they obviously checked it to see whether there was actually any real damage, though. Is it just no? There's no, there's no, there's no damage. It was just uh, dislocated, and and it was four weeks because they had to put um, uh, a pin in in the bow 
So that's why. Right. And the pin's still there. The pin's got to stay there for four weeks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See what can happen from simple accidents. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there we yeah. are. And uh, anyway, get well soon, Michael. We yeah. hope you recover. We hope you're not yeah. in too much discomfort. Thank you, Roger, again for a lovely gallery and uh, and the Sky News. Good. Uh, keep those photos coming in, uh, viewers. Thanks mm -hmm. to Keith for being here. Uh, always lovely to see you, Keith. And uh, we'll have another tournament of bad jokes tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> All right, and and last but not least, of course, thanks to Niall again for being here and uh, yeah. really thought provoking stuff. Uh, do leave a comment in the in the video rather than the chat uh, viewers afterwards if you would be so kind because it really does help the YouTube algorithm notice us and expand and uh, bring you the stuff that uh, we think you'd be interested in. So yeah. there we are. And, uh, so can I just I have one last thing. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to Andy for doing such. Being such a marvelous host and uh, and doing yeah. a great job yeah. every every Tuesday okay. night. Thanks. So, well, oh, that's oh, very kind of you. I'll oh. send it money later. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, that's very kind of you. But yeah, there's always one suck up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's usually you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there we are. All right. Well, that's very kind of you to say so, Bernard. I do. I do try. Um, now, uh, now, in terms of a talk, what I will do at the weekend, I will edit out the talk itself from tonight's show and put it on a loop on the channel so that uh, if, for those people who missed it, uh, they'll get another opportunity to see it and, um, and look out for that. Um, well, I hope to do it on Saturday, but I've got about 40 reports on my students to write on, <laughs> on Saturday, which I'm not looking forward to. I've just marked all their exams. Now I'm going to write the report. So mm. um, so I hope to do that either Saturday or Sunday, and uh, it'll be up on the channel. So keep an eye on that. And uh, so from all of us at Space Oddities, thank you for the coffees this evening. I noticed that some of yes, you have been you. so kind enough to, to buy us some coffees. Marvellous. Thank you so much. Uh, so from all of us here at Space Oddities, we wish you a very good evening. Stay safe. Look after each other. Be good. If you can't be good, be average. And uh, we will see you, uh, see you next week. All the best.